Hello, and welcome to Book Circle. I'm Earl Weinberg. Tonight we begin readings from The Thurber Carnival, a collection of short stories by James Thurber. James Thurber was a widely received humorist and writer of the early 20th century, and his stuff still circulates today, and you're about to see why. The Night the Bed Fell. I suppose that the high water mark of my youth in Columbus, Ohio, was the night the bed fell on my father. It makes a better recitation, unless, as some friends of mine have said, one has heard it five or six times, than it does a piece of writing, for it is almost necessary to throw furniture around, shake doors, and bark like a dog to lend the proper atmosphere and verisimilitude to what is admittedly a somewhat incredible tale. Still, it did take place. It happened then that my father had decided to sleep in the attic one night to be away where he could think. My mother opposed the notion strongly because, she said, the old wooden bed up there was unsafe. It was wobbly, and the heavy headboard would crash down on father's head in case the bed fell and kill him. There was no dissuading him, however, and at a quarter past ten he closed the attic door behind him and went up the narrow twisting stairs. We later heard ominous creakings as he crawled into bed. Grandfather, who usually slept in the attic bed when he was with us, had disappeared some days before. On these occasions, he was usually gone six or eight days and returned growling and out of temper with the news that the Federal Union was run by a passel of blockheads and the Army of the Potomac didn't have any more chance than a fiddler's bitch. We had visiting us at this time a nervous first cousin of mine named Briggs Beale, who believed that he was likely to cease breathing when he was asleep. It was his feeling that if he were not awakened every hour during the night, he might die of suffocation. He had been accustomed to setting an alarm clock to ring at intervals until morning, but I persuaded him to abandon this. He slept in my room, and I told him that I was such a light sleeper that if anybody quit breathing in the same room with me, I would wake instantly. He tested me the first night, which I had suspected he would, by holding his breath after my regular breathing had convinced him I was asleep. I was not asleep, however, and called to him. This seemed to allay his fears a little, but he took the precaution of putting a glass of spirits of camphor on a little table at the head of his bed. In case I didn't arouse him until he was almost gone, he said, he would sniff the camphor, a powerful reviver. Briggs was not the only member of his family who had his crotchets. Old Aunt Melissa Beale, who could whistle like a man with two fingers in her mouth, suffered under the premonition that she was destined to die on South High Street because she had been born on South High Street and married on South High Street. Then there was Aunt Sarah Schoaf, who never went to bed at night without the fear that a burglar was going to get in and blow chloroform under her door through a tube. To avert this calamity, for she was in greater dread of anesthetics than of losing her household goods, she always piled her money, silverware, and other valuables in a neat stack just outside her bedroom with a note reading, This is all I have. Please take it and do not use your chloroform, as this is all I have. Aunt Gracie Schoaf also had a burglar phobia, but she met it with more fortitude. She was confident that burglars had been getting into her house every night for 40 years. The fact that she never missed anything was to her no proof to the contrary. She always claimed that she scared them off before they could take anything by throwing shoes down the hallway. When she went to bed, she piled where she could get at them handily all the shoes there were about the her in the house. Five minutes after she had turned off the light, she would sit up in bed and say, Hark! Her husband, who had learned to ignore the whole situation as long ago as 1903, would either be sound asleep or pretend to be sound asleep. In either case, he would not respond to her tugging and pulling, so that presently she would arise, tiptoe to the door, open it slightly, and heave a shoe down the hall in one direction, and its mate down the hall in the other direction. Some nights she threw them all, some nights only a couple of pair. 
but I am straying from the remarkable incidents that took place during the night that the bed fell on father. By midnight, we were all in bed. The layout of the rooms and the disposition of their occupants is important to an understanding of what later occurred. In the front room upstairs, just under father's attic bedroom, were, were my mother and my brother Herman, who sometimes sang in his sleep, usually marching through Georgia or onward Christian soldiers. Briggs Beale and myself were in a room adjoining this one. My brother Roy was in a room across the hall from ours. Our bull terrier Rex slept in the hall. My bed was an army cot, one of those affairs which are made wide enough to sleep on comfortably only by putting up flat with the middle section the two sides which ordinarily hang down like the sideboards of a drop leaf table. When these sides are up, it is perilous to roll too far toward the edge, for then the cot is likely to tip completely over, bringing the whole bed down on top of one with a tremendous banging crash. This, in fact, is precisely what happened about two o'clock in the morning. It was my mother who, in recalling the scene later, first referred to it as the night the bed fell on your father. Always a deep sleeper, slow to arouse, I had lied to Briggs, I was at first unconscious of what had happened when the iron cot rolled me onto the floor and toppled over on me. It left me still warmly bundled up and unhurt, for the bed rested above me like a canopy. Hence I did not wake up, only reached the edge of consciousness and went back. The racket, however, instantly awakened my mother in the next room, who came to the immediate conclusion that her worst dread was realized. The big wooden bed upstairs had fallen on father. She therefore screamed, Let's go to your poor father! It was this shout, rather than the noise of my cot falling, that awakened Herman in the same room with her. He thought that mother had become, for no apparent reason, hysterical. You're all right, mama, he shouted, trying to calm her. They exchanged shout for shout for perhaps ten seconds. Let's go to your poor father! You're all right! That woke up Briggs. By this time, I was conscious of what was going on in a vague way, but did not yet realize that I was under, under my bed instead of on it. Briggs, awakening in the midst of loud shouts of fear and apprehension, came to the quick conclusion that he was suffocating and that we were all trying to bring him out of it. With a low moan, he grasped the glass of camphor at the head of his bed and, instead of sniffing it, poured it over himself. The room reeked of camphor. <laughs> choked Briggs like a drowning man, for he had almost succeeded in stopping his breath under the deluge of pungent spirits. He leaped out of bed and groped toward the open window, but he came up against one that was closed. With his hand, he beat out the glass, and I could hear it crash and tinkle on the alleyway below. It was at this juncture that I, trying to get up, had the uncanny sensation of feeling my bed above me. Foggy with sleep, I now suspected, in my turn, that the whole uproar was be being made in a frantic endeavor to er extricate me from what must have been an unheard of and perilous situation. Get me out of this, I bawled. Get me out! I think I had the nightmarish belief that I was entombed in a mine. Go! gasped Briggs, floundering in his camphor. By this time, my mother, still shouting, pursued by Herman, still shouting, was trying to open the door to the attic in order to go up and get my father's body out of the wreckage. The door was stuck, however, and wouldn't yield. Her frantic pulls on it only added to the general banging and confusion. Roy and the dog were now up, the one shouting questions, the other barking. Father, farthest away and soundest sleeper of all, had by this time been awakened by the battering on the attic door. He decided that the house was on fire. I'm coming, I'm coming, he wailed in a slow, sleepy voice. It took him many minutes to regain full consciousness. My mother, still believing he was caught under the bed, detected in his I'm coming the mournful, resigned note of one who was preparing to meet his maker. He's dying, she shouted. I'm all right, Briggs yelled to reassure her. I'm all right. He still believed that it was his own closeness to death that was worrying mother. I found at last the light switch in my room, unlocked the door, and Briggs and I joined the others in the attic door. The dog, who never did like Briggs, jumped for him, assuming that he was the culprit in whatever was going on, and Roy had to throw Rex and hold him. 
we could hear father crawling out of bed upstairs. Roy pulled the attic door open with a mighty jerk, and father came down the stairs, sleepy and irritable, but safe and sound. My mother began to weep when she saw him. Rex began to howl. What in the name of God is going on here? asked father. The situation was finally put together like a gigantic jigsaw puzzle. Father caught a cold from prowling around in his bare feet, but there were no other bad results. I'm glad, said mother, who always looked on the bright side of things, that your grandfather wasn't here. The car we had to push. Many autobiographers, among them Lincoln Steffens and Gertrude Atherton, describe earthquakes their families have been in. I am unable to do this because my family was never in an earthquake, but we went through a number of things in Columbus that were a great deal like earthquakes. I remember in particular some of the repercussions of an old Rio we had that wouldn't go unless you pushed it for quite a way and suddenly let your clutch out. Once we'd been able to start the engine easily by cranking it, but we had had the car for so many years that finally it wouldn't go unless you pushed it and let your clutch out. Of course, it took more than one person to do this. It took sometimes as many as five or six, depending on the grade of the roadway and conditions underfoot. The car was unusual in that the clutch and brake were on the same pedal, making it quite easy to stall the engine after it got started so that the car would have to be pushed again. My father used to get sick at his stomach pushing the car and very often was unable to go to work. He had never liked the machine, even when it was good, sharing my ignorance and suspicion of all automobiles of 20 years ago and longer. The boys I went to school with used to be able to identify every car as it passed by. Thomas Flyer, Firestone Columbus, Stevens Duria, Rambler, Winton, White Steamer, etc. I never could. The only car I was really interested in was the one that the Get Ready Man, as we called him, rode around town in, a big red devil with a door in the back. The Get Ready Man was a lank, unkept elderly gentleman with wild eyes and a deep voice who used to go about shouting at people through a megaphone to prepare them for the end of the world. Get ready, get ready, he would bellow. The world is coming to an end. His startling exhortations would come up like summer thunder at the most unexpected times and in the most surprising places. I remember once, during Mantell's production of King Lear at the Colonial Theater, that the Get Ready Man added his bawlings to the squealing of Edgar and the rantings of the king and the mouthing of the fool, rising from somewhere in the balcony to join in. The theater was in absolute darkness, and there were rumblings of thunder and flashes of lightning off stage. Neither father nor I, who were there, ever completely got over the scene, which went something like this. Edgar, Tom's a cold, oh, do, 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 bless thee from whirlwinds and star blastings and takings, the foul fiend vexes, thunder off. Lear, what have his daughters brought him to this pass? Get ready, man. Get ready, get ready. Edgar, Pillock sat on Pillock's hill, halloo, halloo, lulu, lightning flashes. Get ready, man. The world is coming to an end. Fool. This cold night will turn us all to fools and madmen. Edgar, take heed of the foul fiend. Obey thy parent. Get ready, man. Get ready, Edgar. Tom's a cold. Get ready, man. The world is coming to an end. They found him, finally, and ejected him, still shouting. The theater in our time has known few such moments. But to get back to the automobile. One of my happiest memories of it was when, in its eighth year, my brother Roy got together a great many articles from the kitchen, placed them in a square of canvas, and swung this under the car with a string attached to it so that, at a twitch, the canvas would give way and the steel and tin things would clatter to the street. This was a little scheme of Roy's to frighten father, who had always expected the car might explode. It worked perfectly. That was 25 years ago, but it is one of the few things in my life I would like to live over again if I could. I don't suppose that I can now. 
Roy twitched the string in the middle of a lovely afternoon on Bryden Road near 18th Street. Father had closed his eyes and, with his hat off, was enjoying a cool breeze. The clatter on the asphalt was tremendously effective. Knives, forks, can openers, pie pans, pot lids, biscuit cutters, ladles, egg beaters fell beautifully together in a lingering, clamant crash. Stop the car, shouted father. I can't, Roy said. The engine fell out. God almighty, said father, who knew what that meant, or knew what it sounded as if it might mean. It ended unhappily, of course, because finally we had to drive back and pick up the stuff, and even father knew the difference between the works of an automobile and the equipment of a pantry. My mother wouldn't have known, however, nor her mother. My mother, for instance, thought, or rather knew, that it was dangerous to drive an automobile without gasoline. It fried the valves or something. Now don't you dare drive all over town without gasoline, she would say to us when we started off. Gasoline, oil, and water were much the same to her, a fact that made her life both confusing and perilous. Her greatest dread, however, was the Victrola. We had a very early one back in the Come Josephine and My Flying Machine days. She had an idea that the Victrola might blow up. It alarmed her rather than reassured her to explain that the phonograph was run neither by gasoline nor by electricity. She could only suppose that it was propelled by some newfangled and untested apparatus which was likely to get let go at any minute, making us all victims and martyrs of the wild-eyed Edison's dangerous experiments. The telephone she was comparatively at peace with, except, of course, during storms, when, for some reason or other, she always took the receiver off the hook and let it hang. She came naturally by her confused and groundless fears, for her own mother lived the latter years of her life in the horrible suspicion that electricity was dripping invisibly all over the house. It leaked, she contended, out of empty sockets in the wall if the switch had been left on. She would go around screwing in bulbs, and if they lighted up, she would hastily and fearfully turn off the wall switch and go back to her Pearson's Magazine or Everybody's Gazette, happy in the satisfaction that she had stopped not only a costly, but a dangerous leakage. Nothing could ever clear this up for her. Our poor old Rio came to a horrible end, finally. We had parked it too far from the curb on a street with a car line. It was late at night, and the street was dark. The first streetcar that came along couldn't get by. It picked up the tired old automobile as a terrier might seize a rabbit and drubbed it unmercifully, loose, losing its hold now and then, but catching a new grip a second later. Tires booped and whooshed, the fenders squealed and gracked, the steering wheel rose up like a specter and disappeared in the direction of Franklin Avenue with a melancholy whistling sound. Bolts and gadgets flew like sparks from a Catherine wheel. It was a splendid spectacle, but of course saddening to everybody, except the motorman of the streetcar, who was sore. I think some of us broke down and wept. It must have been the weeping that caused Grandfather to take on so terribly. Time was all mixed up in his mind, automobiles and the like he never remembered having seen. He apparently gathered from the talk and excitement and weeping that somebody had died. Nor did he let go of this delusion. He insisted, in fact, after almost a week in which we strove mightily to divert him, that it was a sin and a shame and a disgrace on the family to put the funeral off any longer. Nobody is dead! The automobile is smashed! shouted my father, trying for the thirtieth time to explain the situation to the old man. Was he drunk? demanded Grandfather sternly. Was who drunk? asked Father. Zenus, said Grandfather. He had a name for the corpse now. It was his brother Zenus, who, as it happened, was dead, but not from driving an automobile while intoxicated. Zenus had died in 1866. A sensitive, rather poetical boy of 21, when the Civil War broke out, Zenus had gone to South America, just, as he wrote back, until it blows over. Returning after the war had blown over, he caught the same disease that was killing off the chestnut trees in those years and passed away. It was the only case in history where a tree doctor had to be called in to spray a person, and our family felt it very keenly. Nobody else in the United States caught the blight. 
some of us have looked upon Zena's fate as a kind of poetic justice. Now that Grandfather knew, so to speak, who was dead, it became increasingly awkward to go on living in the same house with him as if nothing had happened. He would go into towering rages in which he threatened to write to the Board of Health unless the funeral were held at once. We realized that something had to be done. Eventually, we persuaded a friend of father's named George Martin to dress up in the manner and costume of the 1860s and pretend to be Uncle Zenus in order to set grandfather's mind at rest. The imposter looked fine and impressive in sideburns and a high beaver hat, and not unlike daguerreotypes of Zenus in our album. I shall never forget the night just after dinner when this Zenus walked into the living room. Grandfather was stomping up and down, tall, hawk-nosed, round-oathed. The newcomer held out both his hands. Clem, he cried to Grandfather. Grandfather turned slowly, looked at the intruder, and snorted. Who air you? he demanded in his deep, resonant voice. I'm Zenus, cried Martin. Your brother Zenus, fit as a fiddle and sound as a dollar. Zenus, my foot, said Grandfather. Zenus died of the chestnut blight in 66. Grandfather was given to these sudden, unexpected, and extremely lucid moments. They were generally more embarrassing than his other moments. He comprehended before he went to bed that night that the old automobile had been destroyed and that its destruction had caused all the turmoil in the house. It flew all to pieces, Pa, my mother told him, in graphically describing the accident. I knew twould, growled Grandfather. I always told you to get a Pope Toledo. Well, we leave you to the automobile of your choice, and we will come back with more next time.